Hello, and welcome to season three of the Vedic Conversation, where each episode we take a different topic and look at it through the lens of storytelling and from the perspective of the Veda, an ancient but still very much relevant body of knowledge from India. I'm Derek Yanford, a Vedic meditation teacher based in New York City, and I'm joined by my Vedic colleagues, Anthony Thompson in London and Rory Kinsella in Sydney. In this episode, we converse with our very special guest, Jenny Blake, a woman I met a few years back during the celebration of Guru Purnima, an event where thanks and gratitude is given to the teachers and mentors of the Vedic lineage who have preserved and passed down this knowledge. Having worked with both Google and Microsoft, Jenny is the founder of Pivot Method, a growth strategy company that helps forward-thinking individuals and organizations map what's next through scalable pivot programs. As an author and podcast host, Jenny calls New York City home while traveling extensively as a keynote speaker. A graduate of UCLA with degrees in both political science and communications, Jenny is constantly learning and challenging herself to incorporate a variety of perspectives and ideas and speaks with us candidly about her decision and experience enrolling as a student at Union Theological Seminary. Have a listen, but don't forget to stick around until the end where we'll share how you can become involved in the conversation. And remember, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Welcome, Jenny. We're so happy you can join us here. Oh my goodness. The honor is all mine. Thank you for having me. I've loved watching your podcast launch and progress and uh, to just get to be have a seat at the table today with the three of you is my greatest joy. So thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm, it, it, it's so weird because the idea of me ever having a podcast was maybe a few years ago. And then I attended your workshop, The Heart of Podcasting, and I kind of talked to you a little bit about it and all this kind of stuff. So the fact that it there's a podcast and I'm having you as a guest on it is, is very surreal. And I think it was so helpful, all the things that you shared in that and, and the way that you shared it. And I think it was through listening to your own podcast, how honest and genuine you mm. are about the struggles of putting one together that made it like a little bit easier for me to even embark on the journey. So thank you so much for that. Oh, way to go of just making it through the gauntlet of podcasting. I feel like it's definitely not for the faint of heart. It's we're not none of us are brain surgeons. I mean, maybe one of you in your your moonlighting as a brain <laughs> surgeon, but but it does take such commitment. And I don't know how the three of you feel, but I feel like podcasting is an exercise in awkwardness. I'm just constantly awkward. I'm constantly um, geeking out over some of my favorite people <laughs> too, that I interview. And then the hard work is just hitting publish and you know it's not perfect or maybe even anywhere close. But the only thing you can do is just keep hitting publish. And it is kind of, I mean, in this case, we have video on, but it's a vulnerable medium because you're not editing and refining the way you might do with writing. It's these organic conversations. There's really nowhere to hide. Like if you have a podcast or in this case, both audio and video, you just have to be yourself and that's it. And then hit publish and do it over and over. So um, kudos for getting this far in. I'm so impressed. Thank you. So just to help our audience get a bit of better understanding of who you are. Can you explain maybe a little bit more about your current projects and how you kind of ended up where you are currently? Sure. Well, many pivots in the making, large and small. That's why Pivot was my second book. And I decided that, and I don't have to tell anyone in the meditation community, but it's like we know this phrase, if change is the only constant. Um, and so I kind of knew that if I could hang my hat on change, that's something I could guarantee in my career is that I'll always be changing and evolving. And so with the book, I adopted this mantra, if change is the only constant, let's get better at it. Mm. So I love the sense of presence that meditation brings, what's here now. And with Pivot, I was trying to answer this question that also vexes so many of us, which is what's next? Mm. And how do we get better at navigating change, which the book came out 2016. I think we can all say 2020 was an exercise in acceptance, patience, presence, problem solving, 
So this is a long winding way to say that I'm 10 years in now to running my own business after leaving Google, and it's still a work in progress every single day. I, Derek, inspired by you and the participants in Heart of Podcasting and in Momentum, my next move is I'm actually launching another podcast that's solely directed at heart-based business owners because I realized that um, I was doing a lot of tinkering behind the scenes and I just 10 years in, I guess I finally gave myself permission to talk about business building and systems thinking and tinkering more publicly. And that's kind of my next, you know, take a deep breath and and launch and with all the fears that comes with it of who am I and what do I know? And I don't have a gazillion dollar business. So, you know, just all those anxieties, like, I don't know that they go away. I just continue to try to keep going and, and keep hitting publish. But I'm in a phase right now where I'm even scared to do that. <laughs> so yeah. I have all these episodes in the can and nothing's public yet. I think it's so important to have that, that expression of your humanity, you know, your vulnerability. This makes you so authentic. You know, people can relate to that. I think we, we're all a little bit suspicious of the very highly polished podcast or podcaster, you know, where there aren't little slip ups and gaffes and, people aren't really opening their heart and mm. allowing people to look inside or hear inside. I, th- I think, you know, what, what you're doing is, um, is bound to be successful because you are so open about your feelings. Mm. And I've listened to some of your podcasts uh, prior to oh, as a little bit of research <laughs> to find out <laughs> more about you and what you think and how you operate. And, um, you know, you, you have a delightful style, which I think mm. anybody can engage with. Well, thank you, Anthony. I really, I really appreciate that. And it's crazy I, how we can all be like doing this and still it's helpful to hear it in someone else's words. You know, there's that phrase, it's hard to read the label from inside the jar. It's like, it's hard to know, is this just total amateur hour or is that authenticity helping the cause? And, and then with podcasting in particular, you look at some of these pro shows and the big networks, they have teams of people like 10 people are working on a given show. So it's also, you, there's, you can't compare. And sorry, I know I cut you off a little bit. No, Go no, ahead. Great. I was okay. interested in, um, you were working for Google and then you, you set up your business and businesses. There was a very interesting moment which caught my eye, which was when you went to the um, Union Theological Seminary. And I'd love you just to explain why you went, because I couldn't really ascertain from from my research, my limited research, why you went and perhaps more importantly, why you left. Two great questions. Um, So Pivot came out in 2016 and, and I started working on Pivot in 2013. So it was a long time that I was really dedicated to that that book and the podcast I thought was a, a cute side project uh, that became <laughs> my kind of main activity, took over everything. And by the time I decided to apply to Union in a very serendipitous stream of events, this was around 2018. So the book had come out. I had done a book tour, a speaking tour, a podcast tour, and increasingly my interest became the intersection of faith and work and specifically the spirituality that pulls people toward change through times of change. I had done some work volunteering, doing career coaching and mentoring in prisons, and I became fascinated by how do these, in my case, I was coaching men. I didn't go to the women's prison, but how these men have aha moments of change and and stay resilient in such a trying environment. And so quickly, my podcast, I just stopped being interested in the nuts and bolts of career change and how to write a LinkedIn resume. Like that stuff never really interested me. And so by the time I had coffee with a friend, he mentioned Union. It was here in New York City where I live. And I decided the applications were closing in two weeks. And I just said, I'm just going to apply I can always say no, but I wanted to study um, specifically interreligious engagement and the growing population that describes themselves as spiritual, not religious. This was very interesting to me, this trend, and there are some people doing great work in this arena. Um, 
and I'm really, you know, my intention going in was figuring out how do we build bridges and how can we connect our work and, and <laughs> some of the students at Union didn't like the term coming out of the spiritual closet, but it was used in certain books that we were reading. But what I found was happening was the more I talked about spirituality on the podcast, interviewing people of all faith backgrounds, the more people would come out of the spiritual closet and say to me, thank you for talking about this, or thank you for having this conversation about faith and work. Or I would be speaking to a client working in a big tech company who said, I'm deeply Christian and I don't talk about that at work. And so I just found it very interesting that for so many of us, whether it's principles like surrender or again, acceptance, meditation practices. I mean, now we see meditation intersecting with the corporate world as like a mindfulness hack, <laughs> you know, like you can be more productive and strategic if you mm -hmm. meditate, which mm -hmm. is like just more what Tosha Silver calls doership. It's just more doing. Mm -hmm. um, and everything has to be so functional. And so many podcasts are about like peak performance and the whole thing just exhausts me. Uh, so I, I attended Union for a semester and a half. My mantra was just like, put yourself in the path of pivot. Like I actually had no clue what was would come of it. I wasn't going to close my business or anything. I was maintaining my business while taking classes. And I loved the reading and the I, big ideas like, what is God? What is the nature of God and belief and belonging? And how do we read sacred texts from a historical or liturgical or um sociological perspective fascinating stuff and then the reason I took a leave of absence was my business just started like really hitting a tipping point and I needed to be traveling I was going to miss a lot of classes so I ended up going on pause um, but I have to say I mean even still no regrets I just they told me I couldn't stay on leave anymore <laughs> so I popped back out um, with an incomplete master's but uh but all my interests are still there. You know, they're just sort of happening on the side now. But I have to say with a lot more structure than I had going in. I'm interested in the other students who were on the course, you know, because obviously they came from a, from a very varied background, multi-faith background. Mm. Did you find that there was perhaps an agenda uh, held by some of them that there wasn't that degree of flexibility and open heartedness, which, you know, you kind of perhaps made you think, well, why are you on the course? Did you come across students like it that? was wild? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was wild. Like the culture. I don't know. I, I think it's kind of maybe it's different going to seminary in New York City, you know, in a city. Um, but a lot of what you read, and this was, I was there in 2018, 19, so it was pre, you know, before the latest election. Maybe I was there 17, 18. In any case, it was quite contentious and, and quite critical. And there was a lot of, um, it was intense. Like, I just <laughs> don't know what you read about certain, like, uh, the culture within universities, um, the good, the bad, the ugly. It was all there and super intense, not only because it was a university setting, but talking about religion and politics in a mm. university setting. And um, I found that there was a mix of students, you know, some were like mid career, some were. Um, maybe toward their encore career, like let's say into retirement. And it was the, I don't want to create, um, I, th I think there was like some of the younger students were much more passionate and like, you know, really drawing, um, I don't know, bold, bold opinions, let's say. And then some of the students I think that were farther along in their career were maybe a little more flexible in certain ideas. <laughs> I'm being kind of vague because it's so, I actually I have to say I felt afraid to speak up in a lot of classes because it was just so tense and it seemed like so easy to offend and and yet it's also such an opportunity for very deep listening about all these nuances of conversation. Like I mentioned that term coming out of the spiritual closet and um, you know some felt that that was co-opting queer theory and that the book we were reading about double belonging in hadn't given enough credence to queer theory. So just fascinating stuff that I really got a front row seat to and did my best to understand. 
But do, do you think this, this kind of attitude of closing down conversation, because obviously there were some rigid ideas, people weren't prepared to listen uh, to what other people had to say, is this kind of closing down of the conversation and having a very strong opinion typical of strata of society within America and perhaps particularly on campuses? Well, there's been books that have come out about this growing trend on campuses because I only know my experience. I, going to Union was very different than my undergrad experience at UCLA. Like it wasn't th this um, sort of rigidity of conversation wasn't there. And there have been books like Coddling of the American Mind that came out right around the time I was at Union. What's tricky about it is, you know, for me at Union, I, I was kind of like I actually had a professor stopped me from speaking in a class and he said I'd like to hear from someone who isn't white and like and so I felt like any any for me having any opinion about any of this was an example of my white fragility or white privilege or invisible privilege and all of those things are tr are true in many ways but it also is it's um I felt like I I never knew what to say or when uh because everything was so tied in with with identity and again acknowledging my white privilege class privilege born in america privilege having a roof over my head privilege just innumerable privileges um i i never felt right about tr trying to even correct like i just didn't know how to navigate this <laughs> the system of the university that i was in and you can hear me talking about it now i'm so awkward about it and i don't really know what to say or what to do about it other than that it was this microcosm of what I think we eventually ended up seeing play out in society a little bit um, in the 2020 election. Um, and in my personal experience, shutting people down just doesn't build those bridges. It just doesn't work. Like the more wrong you make, I, I felt like I was doing my best to understand and still I often felt sort of shut down. And again, that could be my fragility and oversensitivity. But um, it's not going to pull me in. Like, I, I genuinely wanted to be po a positive contribution. And, and I think I could, I could see how some people might just get frustrated and say, F it, I'm not going to stop trying if everything I do is wrong. I could just so clearly see how there would be parts of society and people that give up trying because mm. they can't get it right. Mm. I don't know. I'm even afraid now. <laughs> no, like, where, where's the cancellation coming yeah. once this video goes yeah. live? Because well, cancel culture seems to God. be coming from a lot from universities. And, you know, the, traditionally they were kind of liberal places where ideas would play out and you'd have a debate. But now it's it seems to be more like, hang on, you said the wrong thing. That's it. You're gone. Which is yeah, crazy. And it, and it changes. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's really fraught. It's to me, it's terrifying because like I never, I don't want to offend anybody. I genuinely want to do my best. And you said it, Anthony, like, you know, having an open heart and speaking with kindness. And yet, I I also don't appreciate no matter what side of the political spectrum it's coming from. I don't be appreciate. Um, being told exactly what to think or what to say. Like that's where it becomes frustrating for me where I'm like and then and then the effect that it has is just being afraid to say anything at all and when I was attending union I felt like oh god I should just never write anything ever again <laughs> and then I thought <laughs> I don't know if that's my best contribution to society either is to just never speak or do anything ever again that doesn't seem like the right answer but it was the effect of that type of being immersed in that culture I really felt like just really afraid to say or do anything publicly. Again, it was quite paralyzing. And I think some people would say, well, that's the point. Well, and that's cool too. I get it. I get it. It's like we all can experience that and then have empathy for what it's like being in any number of different contexts where these dynamics are at play. It's, it's interesting that you talk about paralysis and especially maybe with the idea of you're going to go and embark on this journey to gain knowledge, share knowledge, just learn as much as you can, you know, about your own bias or whatever the whole thing is. And then you get into something and you're like, this is not what I imagined. And you almost feel like you're imploding. 
I kind of had a <laughs> similar experience when like the, the George Floyd thing happened only because mm. a lot of the content that I was consuming had this overtone of what my response should be mm. or should look like. And I wasn't having that. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, then I should maybe not say anything because it's not mm. valid or relevant. And the thing I came to recognize was I needed to process what was going on. But then I also needed to recognize, wait, that these are opinions. And nobody or anybody can say whatever they would like about the supposed reaction or actions I should be taking because X, Y, and Z happened. Um, but it wasn't, it, I only came to that realization because I became paralyzed. Because I was like, mm-hmm. I, I, I can't stay paralyzed forever. So what's going to help me start moving again? It was like, oh, I see why you're passionate about your position. And the, the biggest thing that I came to was I'm going to listen so greatly because I don't, I'm not as perturbed or I don't want to be. Mm-hmm. You know, I can see how, you know, you're incensed. And I feel like, well, I, I want to continue giving in the world. And if I, if I take that position, I'm not going to. Um, so I do look at it as a blessing in, in, in disguise kind of that. It's like that extreme from all sides Mm -hmm. conflicting with what you've known, but not to the extreme that that you describe it. So kudos (laughs) for, for making it out. I can't say, no, I didn't figure anything out. Um, I really appreciate what you said, Derek, and bringing that up because I think giving yourself the space and and patience to process is so important. And there were a lot of people, I mean, that was such a a tricky time. Um, Gosh, not to mention the raw emotion or the tragic things that were occurring. But if we're we're looking purely at like communication during that time, um, there was this, you know, some people impulsively react and um, try to do the right thing. Some people were criticized for it's just performative. Then some are criticized silence is violence. So there was one point in the summer where I was like, anything and everything is wrong and not good enough. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. Like we're in this mess. And, and and I think what you said, Derek, is so part of why we all have a practice to the extent that we do. And is that so you can just reground yourself and say, okay, I'm taking in so much. It's so heated. There's so much emotion. And I kind of reach that point too, where I'm like, I can't just rush myself into action or saying things. It's not going to work. Even if there was this, I felt um, there is, was also a call, like, don't you dare stay silent, you know, at the same time as don't you dare say the wrong thing. And and the whole the whole point of that, like part of the deep listening that came to me was like, well, that's great if you feel uncomfortable and you don't know what to do because you're not the one, you know, losing your life for no reason at the hands of the police or whatever. So point taken was just that my any discomfort I had around communication was like only not even a fraction. There's no way I can know um, the extent other than what you said, Derek, which was to listen deeply. And I get zero credit for anything at Union other than just doing <laughs> other than just trying to listen. And honestly. <laughs> where my meditation practice came in is that I used to leave class um, feeling very drained and feeling oh, just extremely drained and partly I had long days and juggling my business. But toward the end, when I thought, can I stand, can I make it in this culture? Like I would be leave in tears. I would just, it was really hard. And um, I knew it's partly the crucible, like it's shaping you, you know, any graduate program probably has some some amount of that. Uh, but once I decided to go to class as the watcher, I just decided not to take it any, any of it personally and not even that I had to say anything in class. I could just sit there and be the watcher as if I was like having an out of body experience kind of. And um, that was the one day I had such transformation. I actually enjoyed my day at class and I um, because I was just watching it as if I had a front row seat at the movies instead of being in it and experiencing the fear and the criticism and the looks people were giving, you know, and the tension in the room. And I'm somebody that I I grew up and um, when I was very young, you know, my parents got divorced when I was five, but they used to fight. It's like, so the 
tiniest amount of tension in a room and I just want to crawl under the desk and hide. So for me to just be able to like sit and watch it, you know, it ended up coming in handy. And shortly after that, I took my leave. But I was I was happy to go out on a note where I felt I had shifted the energy around it a little bit. Mm. You know, the, it's interesting, too, because I feel like the whole idea of God or spirituality or higher mm. power, whatever the label or the term is that we use about it. What's interesting for me that I started to notice is maybe in this podcast or in other conversations that I've had, or I've listened to a lot of other teachers Mm. on podcasts and the word spirituality comes up. And Mm. sometimes we're labeled spirituality teachers. And Mm. for my, for myself, I'm always like, that doesn't describe me. I would never Mm. call myself that only because I feel like spirituality is one of those words like art. Like I would be a fool to try to define what art is. And yet I participate in it. You know, I was a dancer. You know, I teach dance. I I would say that falls under the umbrella of art. And yes, I'm an art teacher, but I wouldn't, you know, refer to myself that way. Um, And so when you say coming out of the spiritual closet, I'm like, oh, I think I have to do that too. (laughs) Because I don't want to ignore that part of me either. And I think that's the thing is I've, I've gotten to the point because maybe all the things you've just discussed oh, if I say spirituality, it's going to conjure up the the ability for people to start throwing those rocks. And I'm like, oh, I don't want that. So I'm not going to use it. But at the same time, let's make no mistake. You know, we're talking about this greater aspect than just being in the body on the planet. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I love conversations like this because, again, it's asking me to go, okay, Derek, what do you really think about spirituality? And how would you like to contribute to the conversation with the, you know, I'll, I I will never miss the opportunity to keep my mouth shut too, if that's relevant. And, and observe, like you said, because I think sometimes you can find some of the greatest answers by witnessing what you do not want to participate in mm-hmm. and why you why that just isn't, your your jam you know so i think you know whatever whatever it is you need to do even when it feels really uncomfortable the fact that you've put yourself in a position and continue to go back or whatnot i think is key because i'm i'm trying to best figure out how to say what is really in my heart and understand that is it's not going to land well with people sometimes, and it's going to be over other people's heads, but who who am I going to cater to? Me, what I feel, or how I think it's going to be received. And this is the challenge, and this is the line that we're walking all the time. So I am thankful for my meditation Mm -hmm. practice as well to help me, you know, help remind me you're imperfect and embrace your imperfection along with everyone else and have conversations like this. (laughs) You know? Well, and and you are, I, I think, by having a podcast with your name on it and discussing these topics and letting it be so organic, you are putting your spiritual kind of fingerprint into the world, all, all three of you are. And also, to, I'll just add to your list of beautiful questions, as David White would call them, you know, one that can't be answered right away. You live, you live the question. But also imagine, imagine people thanking you for putting your spirituality more front and center. So when I when I talk, so I, I I made a promise to myself I would stop apologizing for saying something was woo woo on my podcast. I just got so tired <laughs> of qualifying like this might be too out there for some of you. Uh, I just stopped and I I just said, yeah, money is energy and and I'm not even so far on into the like manifesting what Tosha Silver calls a grocery list for God like. That's not my style either, but I realized I just want to stop apologizing constantly and say what I really think, which is that we are all energetic beings. We're spiritual beings in a body, having an experience, playing the game of life, you know, and and that in doing that, more people have said thank you. And so I guess I would just say the only thing that, that keeps giving me courage is, is two things. One, when I take those risks, more people seem relieved and say thank you so then it gives me the courage to do it again and do more of it like you were saying Derek what you might sort of play with 
And then the other experience I had recently, I looked up one of my favorite books, which is like a mega bestseller. And I went and read the one star reviews. <laughs> everyone says, don't read your own one star reviews. And I'll tell you the funniest one that someone wrote for me. But these one star reviews, I was like, OK, it, it really locked it in. You cannot please everyone. There are going to be people that give a one star review because the book arrived dented. There are going to be people like Manny <laughs> who who told me um, he, my one star review from my first book, Life After College. He said, if you've never thought about anything ever, this book is for you. And I thought, OK, <laughs> how much worse does it get as a one star review? You know, like. Great. I still am proud, even if now I can look back on that book. And and uh, of course, I mean, you know, you should always be embarrassed, I think, by your work 10 years ago because it means you're improving. But he said the worst thing, you know, like you've never thought about anything ever. And um, great. Like I'm still alive. I still get invited to podcasts, if you can believe it. And I'm still going to start tackling my next book, even knowing that another slew of one star reviews are going to come in because, again, as as crazy as our contentious political environment has been, at least in the U.S., not everyone listening will be stateside. Um, it kind of showed me you just simply cannot please anyone, everyone. And in fact, you might actively piss off like half the people that encounter you at any given time. And as and, and I still would strive to build bridges. But um, I don't know. I read somewhere that you're language on your website site should like disgust certain people, <laughs> you know, like the wrong kind of people. But <laughs> so someone reading my flowery language about heart based business and building bridges might be like, this is disgusting. Business <laughs> is about profit. What's wrong with her? That's not even a business. Great. Like good riddance. The sorting mechanism is working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just bland, kind of like a corporate yeah. entity. And that's yeah. not what we do in, you know, call it heart, heart focused businesses. You know, we need yeah. to appeal to people's hearts. And that means finding out who your market is, you know, the people that you want to speak to most and speaking their language. Um, this is a good chance for me to say, Derek, yeah. by the way, I, this podcast's listed under religion and spirituality. I should have said <laughs> that. <laughs> okay. You, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, you know, it had to happen, so <laughs> I couldn't ask to be with better people. <laughs> We're with you, buddy. We're with you. Yeah, all the way, all the way. Yeah, Rory, I Look think Look how you much light it's created. Oh, go on, sorry. Go ahead, Anthony. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. No, Please. you. I was not I was just saying, look how much light it's creating in the world already and bringing you guys together every week and with guests and whoever's listening. It's beautiful. Over to you, Anthony. I think the, the point Rory was making about it, you know, being vanilla, you know, vanilla is just kind of boring. You know, you need some chopped spice and some chilies in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's when we're uncomfortable that when we're really kind of feeling there's a bit of grit, you know, inside our mm. oyster shell. You know, mm. that's when the pearls are going to come. It's when we're uncomfortable that the growth is really going to be taking place. It's, it's when we're super comfortable, mm. we're all snuggled up, and we're safe and sound, and <laughs> we're all cozy. This doesn't serve anybody any good at any time, least of all ourselves. And, you know, I think it's one of the great um, contracts of the 20th and mm. 21st centuries, you know, that we have, you know, that the, 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 the powers that be have sold this sugar pill that everybody wants to take, you know, and um, it, 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 it's a form of manipulation and keeping people under control. And, you know, as you say, we can't please everybody all the time, but we address a very fundamental human need, which is to hear and to be heard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, it's good to sh keep your mouth shut and, and just to listen to what's going on, but you also need to speak up. And, you know, as meditators of any sort, meditators of any sort, we we're tapping into increased levels of consciousness and awareness. And that will tell you that will reveal to you that it's not good just to stand by in mm. a passive way, that you have to plug into that mm. enormous, infinite intuition and wisdom that you're accessing and use it. And, you know, it's it's remiss not to use it. 
You have to use it. Mm. You can't stand by passively. So well said. So well said. You should have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I Brilliant. Wouldn't betray it's my so brothers. true. <laughs> <laughs> and um, wasn't it? It was in the Gnostic Gospels. Speaking of my union learnings, but that uh, well, it's attributed to Jesus. We don't know for sure, but they said if you don't bring f- that forth, that is what within you it will destroy you. My, I'm totally paraphrasing, mm. but it's uh, that we we must we must and. Um, yeah, thank you, Anthony. It was just so beautiful what you just said. And I'm so with you on the, it's not even a sugar pill. It's worse than that. Sugar pills and placebo. I'm like, I love the placebo effect, but it's like the pill of of complacency and sameness and numbing out and surveillance capitalism and all that. Ugh, it makes me so angry. It's so angry, the, the companies that profit off of our attention and just keeping us hooked uh, drives me nuts. So I think to unhook and actually have an opinion and, and speak out and try to do it with a kind heart is is takes a lot of courage and, and there's a lot of noise out there. So just to second everything you said, but you said it much more eloquently. So thank you. I'm going to say that I don't, I guess I, I one, don't look at the comments a lot, but I'm just going to say, I don't know that I, put out content that is gets a lot of comments out of it. But I've heard a little bit of the minimalists, their podcasts and their shows, and they've always said something along the lines of, if you're going to do something remarkable, that means people are going to remark on it, good, bad, or otherwise. And so when you said the one-star review thing, and I think, you know, of course, I'm a little concerned about what the comments would be. So my whole take was maybe, okay, just don't have comics of, comments available or don't look at them. But now I'm like, Mm-mm, I want to go for the one stars. I want to see how many one star comments can I get that are so outrageous almost and, and flip it that way mm-hmm. because they're probably going to come and maybe I'm not complete without that too. So I'm, now I think I have you know, a little bit more courage to put content out there and go, can, let's see how many people I can piss off kind of inadvertently. Yeah, I love I love the lightness around it. And uh, I have the perfect podcast for you as well. It's called Beach Too Sandy, Water Too Wet. Uh, have any of you heard of it? No. I love so the they, <laughs> it's so good. They read one star reviews. It's their entire show. So they just pick categories, different ones every time. And whether they're choosing like Target or a restaurant or um, some kind of French cheese, you know, and then they read all the one star reviews and it's just so <laughs> funny and it brings such levity to the whole conversation. And yeah, I mean, some people say don't ever read them. There's no point. But like to your point, Derek, if you can read them and realize you're still alive, you're still here, it doesn't kill you, it doesn't destroy you. I do think it can take some of the sting out of the next time, because I, I don't know, ho- hopefully you don't have this narrative, but for me, anytime I'm creating something, I'm like, I always have that critic. It's like almost anything someone would say to me in a one-star review, I've probably already said it to myself and needed to just keep going or get over it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so seeing them made real, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. So what? <laughs> you know? I've certainly found in business that actively l- searching for the criticism for the people who are saying, hey, you know, you haven't got this right. You've screwed up on this. This could be some. That's where you're going to make your business better. Your business is not going to be made better by listening to the people who think you're, who keep telling you you're wonderful. Yeah, OK, it's reassuring and it's very nice to have. But actually, that's not going to fine tune and finesse my business. I need to know where I'm making the mistakes and seek out those people to give me constructive criticism so that I can. Yeah, I'm not going to please everybody, but, you know, maybe there's some things that I'm just missing. And because I'm listening to the the beautiful fanfare of trumpets, which is <laughs> is in harmony, mm-hmm. I need to hear the discordant notes rather than the harmonious notes, because that's where I'm going to start to improve. And I think we can get easily seduced into, you know, listening to the sweet voices that whisper mm-hmm. in our ears, because mm-hmm. that's that's inevitably the most charming. But to get uncomfortable and go out and really search. I mean, I, I recently did a, a questionnaire amongst my students 
where I never really gave them the opportunity to say that I was doing a good job. Mm. You know, mm. I was always asking, okay, where could I, where could, you know, did I screw up on this? Could I have done better? Did you feel you were being looked after? You know, I was, I was, you know, the way you phrase the questions and the way you position it is that, you know, I was, I was really wanting them to, to be honest and it was great because, you know, that's what I wanted. I didn't want people to say, oh, Anthony, you're marvelous and it's like, <laughs> having a lovely time and I think I've found what I want. And, you know, I'm not interested in that. I'm really interested in finding out what do they really <laughs> think could be better? Mm. Yeah, as um, my my dad often will edit my texts, and he calls it gloves off editing. So I'm going to give you gloves off. And I had a book mentor say, "Don't spare me, spare the reader." So in your case, Anthony, it's like, "Don't spare my feelings, spare your future, the future students who are going to take this class. Like, save them. <laughs> tell me right now." And I think you can tell who is criticizing you with with. Um, constructive, as you said, and they genuinely want the best for you and they're invested in you. That to me is different than when you get just like a complete toxic troll, which obviously there's not so much that's constructive with that kind of trolling vibe. Some people that just are angry and they want to take it out on you. And then even with those, sometimes I've had someone who it really pissed me off what they <laughs> what they wrote. And um and it actually was like a signal for me. I, I, I took this mantra in the summer, radical reimagining. Everything is up for grabs. And I just had not radically reimagined the area that this person was criticizing. And it led to some major changes in my business, not because I listened to what they said, but because I was so angry and annoyed that I thought, I don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> so there's always some nugget or some kernel or, you know, a negative comment wouldn't bother us unless there was a kernel of truth that we can investigate mm -hmm. and say, oh. Why is this bothering me so much? Maybe there's something for me to look at here. So yeah, it's all such interesting fodder. And I just love how you designed it because I think it is hard. People are don't want to criticize and they don't want to be mean. But uh, it's like, tell me if I have spinach in my teeth. I want to know. <laughs> you know? Please, please don't let me get home and see that I had like toilet paper trailing off the bottom of my pant leg after a speaking engagement. <laughs> no one told me. Like one time I filmed a course and I had a hair sticking out like this and I filmed for an entire day and no one told me. And it's like, why? You know? It's, it's super embarrassing. You're going to hurt my feelings? It? Yeah. I had a friend like, who, who was um, giving a talk um, and he was sitting on a bar stool, you know, sort of one leg up on the bar stool strut and the other leg kind of on the floor. And he was wearing a very tight pair of trousers, which unfortunately had ripped oh, in really a super inappropriate place. <laughs> and it's like, I was sitting in the audience, like third row, and I thought, oh my, you know, everybody saw it. Just everybody saw it. I just thought, you know, what am I going to do? Do I, do I make it worse by going up and embarrassing no, him? Or do I just do? let him go for it? And of course, he had everybody's attention. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah and now he has a real good story to tell yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh uh, that's tough when you're like really interrupting or it's in front of a lot of people that's so hard to know what to do yeah. oh my gosh um i want to switch gears just a little bit um because i know jenny you're still in new york and i had lived there for on and off for almost 25 years but the way my life had unfolded when the pandemic started. I moved down to Florida. I've been here. I go back and forth, but I'm not really there. And the last time I was there was vastly different than the New York that I know it. But the fact that, you know, you, I'm, you know, working from home now and embarking on some new things, but, you know, you're married, you have a dog, you work from home, you travel, you do all this stuff. So my question is, like, the difference between this idea of uh, work-life balance and what people call mm. work-life harmony, how one thing is informing the next. What's your take on all of that, and especially in the new environment that New York City is? Yeah, it's... Um, I feel also what doesn't get incorporated often into the work-life balance or harmony conversation is also 
introversion, extroversion. Um, and especially because I was single for so long, I used to live alone and um, I'm deeply introverted. And I find that being married and having a dog and when I walk a rider twice a day, I'm interacting with neighbors and I just have so much less people energy than I used to have when I was single and living alone. And every time I left my house was my time to just be with the world. And so that has even affected how many meetings I want to have in a given day or how many phone calls I'll, I'll make or my style of networking. Not that I really do that. And, and I think even for those who are deeply introverted, there's so much in the world that's advice around like, networking or even Zoom calls when the pandemic hit. Like right away, I did a podcast on digital introversion and Zoom <laughs> fatigue and just how tiring it can be to stare at the little pinhole all day and let's keep things on the phone. I mean, so uh, I, I find in terms of work, it's almost like work, um, this balance of work and energy and just the energy battery is either charging or it needs to be recharged. And so I have found with the pandemic and raising a German Shepherd puppy and just the sort of craziness of New York City, like my energy, A, is much more variable and B, needs way more recharging. Like I just feel there was this great article and I wish I could remember the researcher's name, but she talked about surge capacity. And she said, if you're feeling exhausted, and this was even last summer, it, it might be your surge capacity is depleted that when the pandemic hit, we all really applied this surge capacity. Like we, we went above and beyond to adapt and navigate change. And so I'm finding now in this new year, I don't feel so new. <laughs> like I feel pretty <laughs> tired. And uh, everything I want to do, I feel like I'm moving through molasses completely. Like, I, like it's as if there's jet lag. My head thinks that I can launch a new podcast while writing a book proposal and yet my actual IRL energy is so different and has not caught up. And that's fine. Again, like part of why we all have these personal practices is to reconnect. And as my friend and mentor, Penny Pierce, she would say of like staying in the flow. And she even said to me recently, you're just too much in your left brain. You need to have more fun. You need to stop trying to do anything at all. And be more playful with it, see what emerges. So for me right now, I'm in the middle of that dynamic. And as far as New York City with the pandemic, I mean, I still love walking out the front door and just being able to interact with so many different people mm -hmm. at any given time. But it is so different without the restaurants and the nightlife and the subway. I, I barely take the subway. Um, so I'm definitely living a more simple New York existence than I ever had. But I don't even think my energy system could take much more stimulation. <laughs> like, and the last thing I'll say is I love being a homebody. Like, I, I guess I'm someone who I'm not that disrupted in the sense that I don't mind not being on the road. I was traveling every two weeks for 10, 15 years. So to be home, this is the longest I've been home. Um, I don't mind it. I love being in sweats every day, all day, every day. <laughs> I only dressed up for you guys. Uh, that's still a sweater and sweats, but I at least like, you know, am conscious that I'm on video, <laughs> which is more than I could say for most days. So that's a rambling response. You can take it wherever you want. No, I, I love it because <laughs> I feel like, you know, as a dancer, it was for me, it was always going to the studio. There was a place to go and do things. And so... You know, and I would travel quite a bit, but I loved the drive that I had and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. When I first was teaching dance online, I was so exhausted in a way like I had never felt before. I, I can imagine. Like, I was like, but I've yeah. been doing this for so many years. Why is it so much more difficult? And then when I tried to equate that to people like yourself or other people mm. who, you know, are more digital or in the online space. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. like I, I felt like I had to rev myself up. Like I can do this. Other people are doing it. And then I'm just like, I don't know that I'm, I'm built to do it. So mm -hmm. just hearing you say your own experience helps kind of um, open up the, a new idea of what I thought mm -hmm. it was supposed to be. But even more so, I feel like I was listening to a podcast by this gentleman. His name is Jason Capital. 
I can't remember who the guest was, but the guest started talking about how at one time in his career, he, he wanted to be where all this action was. He wanted to do this, 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 and this. And he felt like there were these great opportunities that he didn't want to miss. And the older he's gotten, now his kids are getting a little bit older. He's like, I don't want to miss my kids growing up. I don't want to miss this. I don't want to travel. I've, he's built this gym in his house so he could stay home. So he's like actively missing out on certain things. And so that balance, again, I feel like sometimes I'm like, yeah, full in, have the podcast, do all these things. And then there's another part of me that goes, I don't want to do any of that. <laughs> so I, I'm always trying to figure out in this new environment, what balance or harmony looks like, mm. especially because I have a much larger digital presence than I ever had. And, and I, part of me goes, can you keep this up? Is this like realistic? <laughs> you know, so I'm just um, happy that you shared your own uh, perspective on it. It is, isn't it? And I, I have that um, question slash fear as well. Because I'll see people who are like, I've never missed a podcast in 12 years of podcasting. It's been every Sunday. And their strength really seems to be relentless, unfailing consistency over decades. And I, I've had an online platform for 15 years, but I definitely find that my energy goes more in pulses than than others who will say like, don't you dare miss an episode. This is a commitment to your audience. And if you miss a single episode, like you have broken their trust. And I'm like, oh God, the sky <laughs> is falling. But I really, I really genuinely like can't get, can't get myself there. And I don't want to force things. But then you have Stephen Pressfield in the War of Art. It's like, get your butt in the chair. We don't write because we're inspired. We write because it's time to write, you know, so I just like, I don't know, I have to, I'm trying to like reinvent even how I, how I do all of this because I, I got to take a break and I, sometimes I can't announce it and I don't know how long it's going to be. And I don't know, I would just rather put work out when it's in flow and energetically aligned than try to force it to force myself to be like some kind of machine. But I respect the people that are so consistent. I mean, it's truly amazing. So, you bring so up, yeah, bring I'm with up you, the idea of, <laughs> Go ahead, Rory. <laughs> you bring up the idea of reimagining, and I guess if we play that mm. into the idea of pivot, I love how you introduced the idea that pivoting is about accepting where you are and then making the next decision. And, yeah, I'd like to hear a bit more about kind of your philosophy around that. But then also the question is, do you think we can pivot too much? Because, you know, in, in that the war of art, you know, if you pivoted every day, you'd be writing a new book every day <laughs> and you need some degree of consistency to to make anything happen and there and that's going through those down days where you have doubt but it's yeah how do you work out what's what's just a daily doubt that i need to get over to get my thing done and what is a, this is a pivot moment and i need to completely change yeah it's such a good question i'll be curious to hear how each of you thinks about this too Definitely, as someone uh, said to me, you don't want to have career Roomba syndrome, like the Roomba that every time it hits an obstacle, it, it backs up and changes direction. Um, <laughs> <That's> perfect. <laughs> and I also think in recent days and years, like specifically 2020, uh, we just got pivoted every day, every week was something new and different. And you just like, it's like any time I made a plan, it just so quickly got shut down or waylaid or changed. And so it was such an interesting example of probably none of us were consciously, we were just holding on and trying to do our best to adapt. And yet the change kept coming. Like it was just so relentless of everything changing and the rules shifting and the even social norms. Now we watch a TV show and they go hug and you're like, whoa, what is this rated R? Like this is crazy. <laughs> You can't just be hugging a stranger like that, you know, and just like how our norms have shifted is just wild. And um, so when it comes to creative work, I, I think for me, I'm always looking for a sense of momentum. Like, is there a, and flow? Like, am I do I have a sense of forward movement? And I can say right now, right now on the day of this recording, I'm not I'm not clicked in. I, I can't quite get there. I have a flow and focus with the big container, like I mentioned, I'm working on a book proposal. Um, and that comes and goes. So it's not that I will 
change the topic of the pr proposal every time I hit an obstacle, but I might pause and I might say, let me put this down for a couple days or a week. And that to have faith that when I show back up at my desk, new things will have emerged, as my friend Stephanie calls it crock potting, that some people might power through and just sit at their computer and, and write or whatever, create in whatever way every single day. And I think there's a big momentum that comes from that. It's such a good discipline. And I definitely find that the universe or the creative spigot is once it's open and it, I am using it every day, so much more flows in to me. So there's something to be said for it. And I also know that sometimes when I just put something down and can come back with fresh eyes a week later, good things have happened and, and new ideas have emerged. So uh, I guess on the subject of balance, it's kind of for me, I'm just trying to keep these things all in balance. And also there's a Zen saying, don't push the river. Like mm. I just notice so often when I feel rushed or pressured about a project, it's false urgency. I'm just making up a story that I should be farther along or should be doing more. And that's me just over efforting in that case. How do you guys think about it? What's your, do you have a, a take on whether to show up no matter what or take a break? I'm still bathing in the don't push the river. I've never heard that before. And something in me went, oh, my God, that don't ever do that. And I won't. <laughs> I'm, that's like, yes. oh. Yes, I love that one. And lift the oars oh. as well. While we're on the river in a boat, you might as well lift the oars. Yeah. I think, you know, there's an idea of, well, from our Vedic practice, there's this idea of charm. So with our meditation practice, having that de-exciting 20 minutes that we do twice a day, mm -hmm. that allows me to be able to go, well, hang on, which part of this doubt is me just being lazy and which part is, hey, this this is going in the wrong direction mm -hmm. now, things have changed. So I think that's that's the benefit of having that meditation practice to de-excite so it's not the fear-based mm. part of you that's going well I need to I told people I was going to do this this needs to be a success you know those um kind of ego-based motivations and being able to to look with a clearer view with more perspective to say well hang on I have got these doubts but I still want to get over there and this is still the current number one way of mm. getting there and that's that huge benefit of meditation and why it's definitely good to be consistent with meditation where it doesn't get, you don't gain anything if you leave it for a week and <laughs> come back with more inspiration. It's kind of right. where you might, I would agree that you might do with, with something you're writing, but with meditation, it's just look, get it done. <laughs> and it, you're, it, that's such a perfect example of having the structure. Like just, it's, I, I tend to be this way. I think that's why so many meditation teachers will say, just sit no matter what, because you learn to sit when you feel like it and when you don't and stay for your 20 minutes. It's not a question of feeling like it. And also that that all or nothing um, <laughs> just ordered a bunch of Girl Scout cookies and all or nothing is really a problem when you eat the whole bag at once. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have, I have my friend's five-year-old to blame for my Girl Scout 15. But the all or nothing is helpful when it's like not to decide every day, should I write today or not? It's a decision and decision fatigue becomes so exhausting. So I do think these commitments, you know, I had a friend tell me, let's each write 100 words a day every day for the month of December. And this was so helpful because it took the pressure off of having to write anything big. He's like 100 words, that's three sentences. And I knew, okay, I can do that. So when it was not a question of if I would write, but it was just get these hundred words done, even if it's voice dictation through my phone, I did it. And it actually did unlock a lot more creativity. So just like what you mentioned, what you said, Rory, about meditation practice and that structure made me think sometimes committing to at least something tiny, some tiny increment of a container is helpful so that it's that all or nothing, I'm all in to this tiny commitment so that I don't end up having this decision fatigue and every day going through that same cycle. I think Seth Godin talks about this. His book, The Practice, is so inspiring along these lines of just eliminating that mental chit-chat by making that commitment 
to the practice. That expression, elimination, is, I think, very, very important. Um, you know, mm. Picking up on what Rory was talking about, um, I think over this, these, this last year with all these various lockdowns, there's been a huge process of recalibration yeah. that people have been working out what is important, what are my priorities in the work-life balance, the flow, and so on and so forth. And there's been a lot of letting go and the removal of the things that are no longer relevant. And this kind of spring cleaning, both physical, mm. I mean, you know, uh, the charity shops around me have done very well when they opened up because you know, there were just boxes and boxes of stuff that people wanted to donate, to donate. But also it's the internal work, holding on mm. to beliefs and approaches and attitudes which no longer serve a purpose. And, you know, it takes a bit of courage to kind of say, OK, well, that's that's past its sell by date. We need to get rid of that. And of course, by the fascinating thing which occurs, which we all have experienced when we clear out our house, is that there's more space. Mm. Obviously, there's more space and we feel lighter and we feel empowered. And it's a fantastic feeling. And when we do that sort of work inside through the meditations that we're doing, whatever type of meditation, um, you're creating more space. There's mm -hmm. less of that, as you say, less of that internal chatter mm. of the of the what I call the froth and the tinsel mm -hmm. and the glitter. Mm -hmm. It's not really important, you know. It's just kind of attractive, and but it's a distraction. We really want to just kind of push that all aside mm. and mm. really get to what's going to be serving us well mm. today and in the future. And whether it's writing a hundred words a day just so we say, yeah, we did it. And, <laughs> you know, it could have been, I don't know, making an omelette every day, but it's just doing it every day. It's that commitment to a small mm. task and then feeling, yeah, I did it. <laughs> I did it for 100 days. If I can do that, I can do this. That's so yeah. important for one's self-belief. I love it. And just a reminder of creating space. You can, it's just connected in my mind to you know sometimes yoga teacher will say like you're about to do a twist they'll say inhale create space twist move into it and it's almost when you were talking Anthony like you're right I think this past year had us all just pause it was when have we ever had a global pause where everyone around the world was meant to stay home it's like unfathomable the the scope of this global pause and then in doing that creating the space, like just taking the time to take a big deep breath creates space. Sitting in a meditation practice creates space and, and just how you're, you said it, like the spring cleaning that can happen and how much lighter we feel. It is so powerful and it's, it's not easy because it's so easy to fill that space with other things. Um, but it's, it's important, yeah. Okay, thanks for sticking around to the end. This season, we are looking to engage with you, our audience, and would love to know what topics and themes would be of interest to you. Also, who would you like to see as our guests? Perhaps you might be interested in coming on the show and talking with us. We would love to have you. Please share your thoughts and ideas with us via a direct message on our Instagram. And for those of you who are not camera shy, please feel free to share a video with the hashtag, The Vedic Conversation. Also, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And if you found value in this episode, please share it with your audience and consider giving us a positive review to help others find us.